Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, my name is David Pranga. I'm one of the pastors at Brewster Baptist Church. Pastor Doug is away. Um, Doug and Jill are up in Maine on a little vacation. Um, and keep praying for them. They'll be coming back later uh, in the week, or I should say on Monday or Tuesday, I believe. Um, this morning, we're going to continue our series on 1 Peter on chapter 3, and we're going to be talking about marriage. Now, I believe that this passage still speaks to us today, whether it's in a long-term relationship or as a married couple, each of us, we want a great relationship. And we all know that relationships and marriages are never easy. They're difficult. You have the good times and you have times of struggle. And the longer that I've been married, the more I realize how much work it takes to be in a marriage. It just doesn't come naturally, at least, at least it doesn't come naturally to me. But this morning, what I want to talk to you about is, is about the heart of marriage. And the passage that we're going to look at is 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 1 and 2, and then 7 through 9. So I'd like to read those verses to you. It says, Wives, in the same way, submit yourself to your own husband, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. And when they see the purity and reverence of your lives. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with a blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Now that passage is kind of a controversial passage. And for some of you, when you heard the word submit, <laughs> you cringed. You didn't like it. You didn't want to hear anything about it. And that's, I understand. Because submit is not a word that has good connotation. It's something that we often struggle with. But when Peter was writing this letter to husbands and wives, I don't think it was supposed to be as negative as the connotation means in the 21st century. See, Peter was not suggesting that women are in any way inferior to men. Peter was not saying that women need to bow down to men or to listen to everything a man has to say. And I realize women have been hurt in this area for many and many centuries. And I know men have used these verses in the wrong context, and women have paid the price. And it may be for that reason why some of you don't care for the word submit. And I am truly sorry if you've been hurt in this way. And I know there's people here that have. Yet, the Apostle Paul agrees with Peter because the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church in Ephesians. And this is both to men and women. And I want to read this verse to you. It's from Ephesians 5.21. And Paul shares that both individuals, husband and wife, are to submit to each other. 521 says, submit to one another out of the reverence of Christ. Now, why is the husband and wife supposed to submit to each other? They submit simply because they have the other person's best interests at heart. They love their spouse and they want what's best for them. See, when Peter and Paul were sharing about us the word submit, I think if I, had a, if I could change that word in the 21st century, I would use the word honor because it's more positive. And I think that that is what Peter and Paul was getting to. Because when we honor one another, we put others first. We hold them to a high esteem. Instead of looking at our own interest, we're actually looking at the interests of the other person. 
that we love and we want to put them first. And their interests are before our own. And as a husband and wife, we should care and we should love and we should cherish and respect our spouses. So instead of looking at this passage as a negative that many of us do when we use the word submit, I'm going to read this passage, but I'm going to insert the word honor because I think we would look at it in a more positive frame. So let me read to you this verse again. It says, wives, in the same way, honor your husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words, but by the behavior of their wives, and when they see the purity and reverence of their lives. Husbands, in the same way, honor your wives, and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. So hopefully by hearing about honor, you look at your spouse in a way of positive. Now we're going to do something a little different, something Christy I've never really done, and Christy's really not, never done. I'm going to have her come forward, and we're going to actually give the rest of this sermon on marriage and kind of talk about our marriage, okay? Um, and it's going to be interesting, let me tell you. <laughs> let me just say, this sermon took a lot longer to do when you do it with two people. <laughs> but sometimes people look at pastors and their spouses and families and they think they have it all together. And let me tell you, we are far from having it all together. We have found marriage to be both challenging and that we have to continually work at it over and over again. And we decided to bring a picture of when we first got married. Hopefully we have it. We were a little younger then. Much cuter, there you go. The journey started over 20 years ago. We were young, naive, and we didn't really understand what we were getting ourselves into. Christy was 21, had just finished her junior year at college, and I was on staff with Youth for Christ in Racine, Wisconsin. And we had done all the right things. We dated, our, our, we dated for two years, we read books, we went to marriage counseling, um, even our parents sent us on a marriage retreat, so we knew enough about it. But at the same time, there is, no, and I would say, our parents were great role models, but there is nothing that can prepare you for marriage. 20 years and five kids later, life still has many ups and downs. And Christy and I wanted to share with you a few of the keys that we keep coming back to in our own marriage. It helps us keep us focused, it helps us keep us centered. And we hope that maybe some of these things that we're sharing will resonate with you or challenge you or help you out. So just to give you maybe a little bit of background is um, when I went to college, I think I was somewhat broken. I think we all have things in our life that make us broken. Um, I had a really, really awesome family, but in school, I actually went through a fair amount of teasing, bullying, just feelings of rejection, and my self-esteem definitely took a hit. So when I went off to college, I was looking for a fresh start, and I think I had like a a hole in my heart that I was probably looking to be filled. And I met David my freshman year, right off the bat, first couple of weeks of school, and I definitely had a crush on him, and as it turns out, he was interested in me as well. So I was on cloud nine because no one had been interested in me. I had not dated at all in high school. So we were young and we were in love, and I didn't really know myself that well. Um, I was still growing, I was still discovering who I was and who I wanted to be. Um, when you're young and in love, you don't really look at the things that are different about you, and we are actually, turns out, pretty different people. <laughs> so we have different interests, different personalities, different temperaments, different ways of handling conflict. I mean, you name it, we were very different. And, you know, some of those things came out, like we actually took tests and like, you know, my score would be up here and David's score would be down here and, you know, like we're young, we're in love, you know, it didn't really, it didn't really matter. You know, things kind of fade away and I was 21, I was really young and I was bringing with me a brokenness that I don't think I even knew that I had at the time. And I was bringing expectations that I didn't even know I had. You don't know those things until you start 
really getting into living with another person. So I don't regret getting married at 21, but looking back, I can really see that I was very naive. I didn't really know a lot about myself or about life at that time, but shortly after we got married, all those expectations that I didn't know I had, I realize now that I do have, and things started to kind of come crashing in. And it's like, it wasn't what I signed up for. It was really, really hard. But there was one major thing that we had in common that carried us through, and that was our faith. So the first key to a healthy marriage for both of us is that we want to share with you, it's so important to have a solid foundation of Jesus Christ. See, when we started with this one, it made all the difference in the world because it was kind of our bedrock. We actually discovered that we were very different people. I mean, extremely difficult different people, let's just say that. But we had one very important thing in common, and that was our relationship with Jesus. And Christy and I were fortunate that we both believed in God, and we were both Christians, and we wanted, to, we wanted to follow the Bible, we wanted to love one another, and we made God a high priority. I want to show you a picture of a, or I want to, you to picture of a house, okay? And if I ask you to look at that house, okay, what's the most important feature of that house that you're picturing? The foundation and that's the most important thing because when storms come upon a house you need to have a strong foundation because if you have cracks in the foundation the house may not survive but when it's solid you can move forward the house can withstand those storms because it has a solid foundation and as Christians our foundations need to be with Jesus Christ our faith in God has to be very important and one of the things that I share with couples as I do premarital counseling, and as, they, and as pastor did premarital counseling with us, is what we call the marriage triangle. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but we have a slide forward. It's really a simple diagram. And there are three points of a triangle, and God is at the top of the triangle. And the husband and wife is at the bottom. And the closer the husband and wife are to God, the closer they will get to each other. And as we move closer to God individually, and as a couple, our relationship will grow closer. But the further we are away from God, really the further we are from each other. And if you really want a marriage that is built and blessed by God, you really need to take time out and work on your spiritual life and your time with God. For me, the most important relationship in my life is really God. The more I spend with God, the more I realize that I need him more in my life. And when I spend time with God, I begin to not think about my own self and my own selfishness, but I begin to think about my spouse and her needs. And my eyes change. My focus is not so much about me, but on the person I care most about. And God has taught me to love and to offer grace. And there are times when I just have to pour out my stress and my struggles to God and just give it to him. And when I give it to him, I just get this peace that everything's going to be okay. So Christy, what does having Christ as a foundation look like for you? So I think for me it just starts with recognizing that I really do need God in my life. And the farther I get along in my life and in my family and in my marriage and with my kids, I realize that I really do need God. It's just not my natural tendency to love unconditionally, to give grace or forgiveness, and I don't have all the wisdom that I need. And I realize that my own efforts fall very short and that I really do need God to come alongside me. So right now, I'm in a busy season of life, fairly new, I'm a couple years into this season, but we, David mentioned we have five kids. I'm a second year now into a job. Um, prior to that, I was always at home endless activities. We're driving here and there and everywhere. Um, we have, you know, still laundry, dinner, homework, all the right. I mean, it's just very, very busy. And the only time that I really have to find quiet in my life right now is in the morning. So I can tell you I am not a morning person. I've never gotten up early my entire life. But for some reason, God has really given me a grace for this particular season to get up early. So I usually get up before anybody else in my family is awake, and I just spend a little bit of time in God's Word. I love my Bible app on my phone. I use that mostly now. And I have a journal with me, and I just might write down some verses, things that I feel like God might be speaking to me. And I also just use my journal 
I just, if you read through my journals, you'd have nothing all that spiritual about them. They're just basically all my worries, my concerns, disappointments, my fears. I mean, when David is driving me crazy, which I know that you probably find hard to believe, but <laughs> I, I pray for him. Sometimes when he's bothering me the most, I find that if I just pray for him, or if I write down just a few things that I appreciate about him, I find that my thoughts and my mind begin to become transformed. And sometimes as I pour things out that I'm angry or disappointed in, I just find that God will just softly and gently show me things that I can change in my thinking. He sometimes gives me a different perspective or a new angle, and I start to feel like I have the capacity to have grace and compassion. And I'm probably not making a whole lot of sense, but I guess what I'm trying to say is that we can't change on our own. We really need God to change us. And I can't tell you how often I start just pouring out all my hurt, all my disappointment, all my fears to God on paper, only to find that at the end of it, I start to feel his peace and his presence and his assurance. And he really does change my heart and renew my mind. And I wish it was just a one and done deal, but I find that it's an everyday thing. And I can tell when I don't spend that time. Well, the second key to our healthy marriage would definitely be a healthy looking at honor and respect. In this passage, Peter shares with us that we are supposed to honor and respect our spouse. And one of the studies that Christy and I did um, a few years back was called Sacred Marriage. And we were going through a book called Sacred Marriage by Gary Thomas. And the premise of the book is simply this, and it really struck us differently. It says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy. I want to read this over again. What if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? See, honor for most of us just doesn't come naturally. It's far easier to focus on my needs, my wants, and my desires than to think about my spouse's needs, my spouse's wants, and my spouse's desires. See, when I think of the word honor, it begins thinking about the other person first. And honor shows kindness, caring, loving. It's really cherishing the other person. It's seeing your spouse as really a child of God. See, when I look over the course of the 20 years of marriage with Christy, this is the one area that I struggle most about is really honoring my wife. She has it down. I'm still learning this. There was a great book that helped me with this. It was called The Five Love Languages. And The Five Love Languages helped me to identify, the Five Love Languages book, it helps you identify ways that people show love and how people receive love. And for me, I was showing my love the way I wanted to be loved instead of the way Christy needed to be loved. So I needed to have a paradigm shift and think about, okay, what are the things that Christy really likes? What are the things that are going to bring her the most love? And number one that came up was affirmation. It's just simply sometimes I need to write a letter to share how much I love my wife. Sometimes it's giving her flowers or sending her a text of encouragement. The second thing that really spoke to Christy is quality time together. She loves it when we go and we do the biking on the bike path, or if we kayak, or if we go for a walk, looking at the ocean with a beautiful sunset. Those little things like that mean so much to her, and it shows that I care about her, that I'm honoring her. And the third one is just, she loves it when I make dinner on the days that she works. And I won't explain anything more on that. You know why that is. But these are just some of the ways that I just try to honor my wife. See, honoring my wife is all about making her feel special, for Christy to feel cherished and loved. So Christy, what does honor mean to you in our marriage? And what is God teaching you right now about it? Okay, well, I think right now, really right now, God is teaching me a lot about honoring just starting in my thought life. And I don't know if any of you guys can relate to me, but I am a high introvert. I mean, there's introverts and then there's, there's me. I'm a, I'm a very high introvert. I don't say a lot. Coming up here is extremely difficult. I don't talk a lot out loud, but I have a constant running thought life. 
I am always thinking, rehashing, analyzing, processing. I mean, it just never turns off in my head. So a lot of my life is in my, my, my brain. So I'm realizing that I need to gain more control over my thoughts. And sometimes instead of sharing or talking about how I'm feeling or things that upset me, I can just find myself dwelling on in my mind on ways that maybe David's hurt me or disappointed me. And if I'm not keeping my thoughts in check, I start thinking that our marriage isn't working. And I can be judge and jury and declare him guilty all in my head. And he has no clue that he was even on trial. <laughs> so, poor guy. And if I'm not careful, it comes out in you got bitterness. got a great marriage, let me tell you. <laughs> comes out in bitterness and resentment. So I'm kind of a slow learner. It's been 20 years, but I'm realizing more and more that just because a thought comes in my head doesn't mean that I have to dwell on it. I can choose what I want to dwell on. So I can find that I find that when I'm hurt or I'm feeling wrong, those first thoughts that come into your head, they're the loudest thoughts, and they're the ones that are saying to retaliate or to stay angry or to punish in some way. There's the, they're those thoughts that make me want to think the worst. Um, but I realize now that I can choose to redirect my thoughts to more positive things. I can invite God to be a part of my thought life, and I can choose to really be still and find his quiet voice. I don't have to automatically judge every action as if David had the worst intent in mind. Um, one thing that stood out to me, someone once showed me an illustration of a, just a piece of white paper with a black dot in the middle. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. And so often when we think of people, we just see that little black dot all the bad stuff about that person. And we don't notice the whole entire sheet of paper that's filled with white. And so I guess it's just a long way of explaining that honor sometimes for me is just choosing to think kindly of David, even when it's easier to nurse a hurt. It's choosing to remember things that I love about him or ways that he's helped me or supported me or praying for him it's when I'd rather just be dwelling on maybe a way that he's treating me. And so I find that changing how I think about David from negative to positive and choosing to share those hurts with God and inviting him to be a part of that can really be helpful. And story number two, <laughs> honoring is also putting David's needs at times before my own. And like I said, we're, just, we're in a really busy season of life right now, and it's really a lot of fun, but it's also really challenging. And I mean, kind of a day in our life is we're both really up early in the morning, we're getting kids up, we're getting everybody out the door, we're getting ourselves ready, we're going out the door. Afterwards, we're picking up kids, we're going to meets, we're going to games, activities, we're making dinner, we're cleaning up, we're making sure homework is done, lunches are made, I'm tucking in a couple of them. You know, I like to watch a favorite show, but lately I just fall asleep before it's even over. I'm saying good night to my kids. I go to bed before they do, my older three. So needless to say, we're just in a stage of life where it's really hard to have a conversation. We just, we don't connect very often. We don't, we talk about the essentials and that's about it. And so David recently approached me and he was just sharing that he felt like maybe our relationship's a little neglected and you know what maybe what do you think if we just like try to spend 15 minutes a day just 15 minutes to kind of go off on our own and just kind of share about our day and honestly that kind of made me mad i was like i don't have 15 minutes in my day <laughs> i mean if i give you 15 minutes i might you know it's like i just don't have time for myself at all i mean i'm an introvert i need some time to just sit read, watch a show. I'm like, I don't think I have 15 minutes, but you know, we kind of hashed it out and I begrudgingly said, okay, I'll try. I know this sounds really awful, but that's like how bad it's gotten in our house. So, and it was so enlightening. It's like, I actually found out after we, we did our first 15 minutes, we actually talked longer than 15 minutes. And I actually found out that I like to talk and to share with David. And it's a lot easier to like each other and understand each other when we're actually talking to each other. So I find that there's just different seasons in life. And there's been seasons where we've had lots of times together. And right now, we're just in a season where it's hard to sometimes just have a conversation. So I was really glad that I honored that request. And it's helped us tremendously. OK. <laughs> She does a fabulous job. So you know, the third key to a healthy marriage is simply forgiveness. Okay? Verse 9 says, Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. See, we live in a culture overrun, sort up grudges, 
resentment, bitterness, and broken hearts. In all relationships, in all marriages, there are times where you're going to have conflict. And we say things that we probably shouldn't say, and we do things that we really regret. Husbands and wives are far from perfect. Both of us make mistakes, and we need to learn to forgive each other. So what is forgiveness? If you really had to define forgiveness, it's really letting go of the bitterness and the anger towards the other person. It is the ability to wipe the slate clean, to release the debt, to cancel out the punishment. To, simply, to forgive simply means to give mercy and not to demand justice. See, I believe forgiveness is really at the heart of marriage. Since Christy and I come from different families and we have value different things and we look at life so differently, we have conflict. We have conflict all the time. But Christy and I have, to learn, have learned to work through our arguments and we learn to forgive each other. I know this may sound very simple, but we had to learn to say, I am sorry. And the key word was, will you forgive me? The first 10 years, it was all about, I am sorry for causing this. And then my wife said one time, she goes, will you forgive me for it? And it's like, oh my goodness. Well, yes, I guess I gotta have to forgive you. But when you, when you forgive someone, you're wiping the slate clean. You're, you're not holding on to that grudge. You're not holding on to that hurt. You're saying, yes, you've been forgiven and I will never bring this up again. For, for me, those simple words, will you forgive me, really changed the way I looked at for forgiveness. It was one of the biggest lessons that I learned in our marriage. That was, we would both need to learn to say, I'm sorry, and will you forgive me? And we need to remember that God forgives us. And since God forgives us, we need to forgive our spouse. So the fourth key, the fourth key in a healthy marriage that we believe is prayer. And prayer, I, we just think, is so important in a marriage. And I know prayer can seem uncomfortable, and there's a lot of things people conjure up when they think about prayer, but we just believe that prayer as an individual and as a couple is just so helpful in our marriage because we really need God's help in marriage. It's difficult, and we realize early on that we can't do it by ourselves, so we have to continually invite Jesus to be a part of it. And I don't know about you, but I believe that Satan is alive and well, and I believe that there's one thing that he does not want you to do in your marriage is pray. And I feel like that is, if you're going to have any resistance, try praying together you will find lots of resistance in your marriage because he doesn't want that to happen because prayer is very powerful and we need God in our, in our lives. And um, just a couple things, it's just very dear to my heart because I find that when I, I go through seasons when I feel like I'm praying and there's seasons where I feel like I just am not praying well and I can just see such a huge difference. But um, a couple of things that we try to do it's just like pray maybe before we go to bed at night or pray before we go to work in the morning. And a couple books that I have um, that I thought were very helpful for me are called Power of a Praying Husband, Power of a Praying Wife, There's Power of a Praying Parent. All of those are so good. They're by an author called Stormy or Martin, and they actually have the prayers written right down in the book. So it kind of gives you an idea of like things you can think about, things you can kind of bathe your family in prayer. I just know that when we pray together, it's sort of like, um, we will share what our problem, whatever stress that we're going through, um, whether it's with the kids or whether it's with work. And when Christy, let's say, shares with me something that she's going through, I just feel like when, when she invites me to hear what is going on and I can be praying for her, I, I care then more about how's her day going. I care about how that struggle and how is that working out. And I want to be more of a cheerleader. I want to offer support and encouragement. In the same way, when I share with Christy, you know what, I'm struggling with this, can you pray for me? I know that throughout the day, if she, when she has time, she's praying for me. And it brings me support. It knows I don't feel like I'm all alone. And I think one of the struggles with us in any marriage couple, and we struggle with this especially early in our marriage, was we just didn't pray together because it felt kind of awkward. It felt kind of weird, and I don't know how to explain it. But you know, you just have to get over that weird feeling. And you need to make time. And you know what, the challenge for you this morning is find time, whether it's at mealtime, 
at dinner time when you're both together to just pray together, or maybe it's before work, or maybe it's before you go to bed, but really spend some time praying because it's going to help your marriage and it's going to help your spiritual life and your emotional life as well. Um, we just both believe prayer is so important. So kind of wrap things up and looking at the four keys to a healthy marriage for us, and we're still learning, and many of you guys have been married way longer than we have, but for us, number one, it's the foundation in Jesus Christ. Number two, it's honoring and respecting our spouse. Three, it's forgiveness. It's not hanging on to the grudge, but it's really forgiving the person. And number four, it's prayer. See, what we also believe is that God will always bless your effort. God cares if you're willing to go out on faith and take a step forward and try. And we have really seen God honor that. He wants us to improve in our marriage. And God knows that marriage is hard. But God is for marriage. And he will help you along the way. And all you have to do is ask. So on that, we're going to close with a word of prayer. So hopefully this was encouraging for you. So let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, Lord, for everything you've given us, Lord, that you can be a solid foundation for us, Lord, that you can be a listening ear, that you can give us encouragement, that you just love us. And Lord, I pray for each and every married couple or people that have been in long-term relationships, Lord, help each couple and help us, Lord, to honor our spouses and to love them the way that they want to be loved, not the way we want to love and receive love. Lord, help us in our marriages to forgive and to say that I'm sorry and will you forgive me? And God, help each and every one of us to develop a prayer life, one of support, one of sharing the things that are going on in our life with you. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.